Good afternoon, Miriam. How are you today? Very good. So nice to be with you. Absolutely. Uh, I want to start by just welcoming our viewers and listeners of the Healthy Peaceful podcast. This is Noreen, and today I have a wonderful, exciting guest with me to continue our series on Ayurveda. Uh, and this is Miriam Kassin Hospadar. Did, did I get the pronunciation? Was Kaysen. my pronunci pronunciation Kassin? Kassin, yeah. Oh, Kassin, great. Miriam Kassin Hospadar. Uh, and I'd like to just take a few moments and in, uh, a few words about Miriam's background. She was born and she grew up in Berkeley. Uh, music was a big part of her um, growing up period. And uh, you could always find her at some rock concert in her very early life. Um, she said she got hooked on the blues. Uh, she was also at virtually every street demonstration imaginable at that time. You were growing up in the, in the 60s, I believe. Yes, Vietnam. So there, yeah. so there were plenty of dem demonstrations at that point. Oh, yes. And of course, Berkeley was a haven for, for or, or was the, uh, um, really the um, uh, center of, of much of that as well. Um, I like your comment in your bio on your website, which you indicated a little too much was going on for peace of mind. And in 1970, you decided to learn TM, a transcendental meditation. Um, so that was quite an antidote to um, street protests. Uh, you became a teacher of TM in 1973, and you've taught uh, both in the U.S. and abroad. Uh, and you studied and you work with the Maharishi Mahesh, Mahesh Yogi the founder of the TM in both Europe and India. Uh, you are an, an artist and a writer. Uh, you have um, several degrees, including a BFA from the California College of the Arts. And you have spent many years cooking as a chef in France and Switzerland. Uh, in South India, you ran a health spa in Missouri. Uh, and you've had many, many other uh, experiences and worn many hats. Um, and your bio on your website, you end with a quote, which I really love work like you don't need the money, love, like you've never been hurt, dance, like nobody's watching. Right. That's Satchel Page. <laughs> yes. By Satchel Page. Um, it's funny. I'm not sure how I came upon your book initially, uh, the book, which now, um, uh, I believe this book was published in 1999, Heaven's Banquet, um, the Maharishi Ayurvedic cookbook, and it's over 600 pages. Uh, but I remember, and you know, I'm, I'm funny about books. I, um, I buy them and then I give them away. I don't, I don't collect books, but I rebuy them. So I now have owned your book. This is the third time. <laughs> and so you, you'll be happy to know. And I actually have it in paper this time instead of reading on the computer, which is even more fun. Well, I have the hardback here. I actually don't even have the paper. So. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Because we can't, you know, uh, everything's obviously electronic, most of it now. Um, but what struck me, and you know, it's funny. Every time, it's like, you know, when you watch a film or read a book again. And you wouldn't think that would be the case with cookbooks per se. Uh, but what struck me this, you, you always see something different. I, I find when I um, look at a book several years later. And I think what I really gleaned this time from the Heaven's Banquet um, is just um, your appreciation uh, for food. And you know, that is really hard. You can, you can sense it in the pages. Uh, so could you speak to that word appreciation and how it relates to Ayurveda? Well, it's good to really love what you're doing. And I love cooking and I love making people happy. I really like cooking for other people the most and um, thinking about what's gonna please them and what they'd like and uh, so, uh, and I like to know the sources of ingredients so that I appreciate them from where they came from as well as just picking them up at a store. And um, 
it just it makes me happy to cook yeah yeah that's wonderful and so that i for me that really came through in the pages of the book Oh, good. Uh, you know, and there, and there, and, and actually, even in the cookbook world, it's hard to find that. Really? Uh, yeah. I, I, you know, that it just, uh, um, at least for myself, you know, I just, I just really connected with that this time appreciation. Wow. So, so thank you for that. It's a gift to the reader as well. Well, it was yeah. really a labor of love. It took years and years. And, uh, it, I, I kept learning as I was doing it from Ayurvedic doctors and from Maharishi and uh, cooks, and it, it was a really wonderful project to do. Yeah, when I you about writing, I know when you set out on this journey, uh, it was you, you indicated in the book, yeah, that it was a, tw a twenty-three year journey for you to um, this book. Um, yes. Tell me, did you work on this for twenty-three years, or it was? 23 years that you were uh, professionally, personally involved with Ayurveda meditation and also the culinary culinary aspects of it um, that you were collecting. Were you doing it with the intention of eventually um, producing a book or is it just something that, how did, how did the, um, what was the impetus for this book? Well, I had written one previously called yes. The Enlightenment Cookbook. And that I had, it was a vegetarian cookbook and I had okay. uh, collected recipes from all over. I was uh, a chef in Europe at that time and at a university and the students would give me their mother's recipes and such. So that was really the basis of Heaven's Banquet. But then uh, that was in the seventies. And then in the eighties is when Maharishi began reviving Ayurveda and I started studying it. So I wanted to incorporate the principles of Ayurveda into the cookbook I had already done, but okay. then it transformed into something completely different. I see. So the first cookbook you did, um, you said the Age of Enlightenment. Yes. Um, that cookbook was um, focused on vegetarian cooking, not necessarily Ayurvedic. I didn't know anything about Ayurveda at the time. Okay, okay. So it was a vegetarian cooking uh, cookbook, but it used fresh foods, which is very important in Ayurveda. So it was a start. Absolutely. And um, you indicated that the Maharishi um, in the 80s wanted to introduce Ayurveda. Yes. Um, and how were you um, introduced to Ayurveda? Uh, through him. Mm -hmm. uh, he was very concerned about how health systems didn't seem to be curing diseases necessarily, and that there was this ancient tradition in India of Ayurveda. Ayu means life and Veda means knowledge. So it's literally knowledge of life. And it had been, it had fallen into disrepair uh, because the British, when they ruled India, had suppressed the indigenous medicine. And so Maharishi wanted to revive it and he sought out Vaidyas or Ayurvedic doctors who came from long family traditions and had maintained the traditions and the traditional knowledge over the years where it hadn't gotten corrupted by having been you know, interrupted. Uh, so I was in India and with him and he had Ayurvedic doctors coming to discuss, uh, they, they put all the diseases in alphabetical order and would discuss each disease of what the Ayurvedic treatment was for it and then what the Western medicine treatment was for it. And I very fortunately got to sit in on those talks. And uh, uh, there was also a lot of discussion about food because that's a very important part of Ayurvedic medicine is diet. Mm -hmm. So uh, I began to learn about principles of Ayurvedic diet there. Okay. And then I continued. It was an Ayurvedic clinic that I was running in Missouri. So there I was working with the Ayurvedic doctor who was the doctor for the clinic. I was cooking for the patients and making the food that he prescribed for each person. And uh, at that time, I, I really wanted to make an Ayurvedic cookbook. And it was in... Um, 1986 that I saw Maharishi and I told him that I wanted to do this and mm -hmm. he said well it'll take a long time and you'll have to talk to me about it 
And I thought, okay. I can live with that. <laughs> there, so there were some stipulations. Well, he, he, those were his comments, and that's exactly what happened. It took a long time, and I did have to talk with him about it. It was great. Right. Yeah. Well, I, somewhere in the book, you indicate that, you know, the... Um, the Charaka, the um, I'm I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it, the Charaka Sam, Samhita, um, that you know there's a lot. It really references food and the importance of food to Ayurveda, and to sustaining our health through and thriving through the Ayurvedic system, um, but not a lot of attention to recipes. Right. So how do you go from this tradition, this ancient text of, you know, over 5,000 years to to bringing it into um, this book, Heaven's Banquet, um, in terms of modern Ayurveda or, or to the Western world and the, and the Western palate? How, how did you, how are you able, I mean, first, I would imagine that would have to be um, a personal transformation mm -hmm. for you. Um, but how were you able to translate that or bring it bring it forth in a way that was meaning that's meaningful to Westerners? Well, Maharishi was making Ayurveda available in a way that Westerners could understand it. Mm -hmm. So I was used to his vocabulary and the Ayurvedic mm -hmm. doctor's vocabulary. So it wasn't trying to decipher an ancient, ancient text okay. that uh, okay. you know didn't use ovens and stoves and you know. Uh, blenders and things sure, like that. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and uh, I took the basic principles of Ayurveda and then applied them to recipes from around the world. I wanted it to be international and Marishi wanted it to be international. So um, I just took those very basic principles and applied them to the dishes, which mm -hmm. are uh, that food is best eaten fresh Mm -hmm. um, not canned or preserved kind of foods, except for dried fruit is okay, but uh, generally fresh produce. And in season, seasonal food is very important. Mm -hmm. And then there are certain mind body types in Ayurveda that different foods nourish. And uh, so I was thinking I had those in mind while I was doing it. Mm -hmm. There are uh, the, it's interesting, the basic cause of disease Ayurveda feels is something called Pragya Parad, which means right. the mistake of the intellect. Yes. It means that one has lost one's connection to the source of life, which is one eternal, unchanging, holistic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like looking at an ocean and we just see the waves on top of the ocean as we live our life, but actually our whole consciousness and life itself has quieter, subtler levels, like the deeper levels of the ocean. Mm -hmm. So regaining that um, uh, connection is very important for health. And my long practice of transcendental meditation uh, was very helpful for that. And then uh, from there, uh, the main watchword is balance, staying in balance. And uh, Ayurveda is very flexible because it says that we all have inner intelligence. Our body has intelligence. And we just have to create the conditions so that we hear our own body's intelligence. It'll tell us what to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's, you, you've just, uh, in that, um, you brought in so much there about, um, you know, Ayurveda has certain principles that, are important to adhere to regarding food, um, some do's and don'ts. Um, and um, you mentioned some of them, like trying to eat, trying, doing the best you can to really eat freshly prepared food. Mm -hmm. it, it really um, discourages leftovers because yeah. of the, because there's uh, lacking prana. Yes, um, that's that whole thought that things taste better the next day is not an Ayurvedic principle. It's yes. that you get the fresh energy from the food when it's cooked freshly. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think that also, um, um, yeah, that's that's really wonderful because that's that's an important concept. Mm -hmm. uh, and you make, um, it's either a quote in your book or just a paragraph where you say that, um, you know, it may take us a little longer 
to prepare food freshly every day, um, especially with the modern pace of life, but it could add years and quality to your life. Yes. Well said. Yes. So, uh, so that's really encouraging, um, you know, encouraging us to invest our time um, in, um, and, and they don't have to be elaborate meals, but freshly, yeah. freshly prepared food. Yeah, it can be very simple, but freshly prepared is really, it makes a difference. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I think we're, a lot of people have been kind of trained away from cooking as being a, um, a positive activity uh, yeah. and don't want to take the time to do that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it is a very enjoyable thing to do and to have your hands on the food and be smelling it and mm -hmm. looking at it as you cook. It's, uh, it's a wonderful experience. Um, Absolutely. I uh, met a very uh, revered Ayurvedic doctor when I was in India named Balraj Maharshi. He's no longer alive but he was with, he was one of the Vaidyas that was with Maharishi. Mm -hmm. And I asked him once about healthy cooking and what I needed to know about healthy cooking. And he said, oh, you know, that's a very good idea. Come see me tomorrow morning. So, <laughs> so I dressed up the next morning and I had my <laughs> notebooks and my pens all through to take down his wisdom. And he looked at me and he just said, always have positive thoughts while you cook. It's negative thoughts in the mind of the cook that cause disease. Mm, okay. So enjoying cooking is yeah. part of the process. Yeah. And you I, can't force yourself to enjoy it, I know, but uh, make things you like and eat uh, things you like. That's a very important part of Ayurveda is that oh, the food is yeah. delicious. It's not that you eat something just because it's healthy, even if you don't like it. The whole process of digestion starts the minute you put a morsel of food in your mouth and you taste it. Yeah, so yeah. The whole process. And Absolutely. really enjoying your food is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want. I definitely want to pick up on that. Um, but that's uh, that's beautiful. What um, the 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 Ayurvedic doctor said to you, the the Vaidya yeah. um, that um, it the mind and the heart of the chef. Um, is you know it's these it, these elements are very important yes. to um yes. you know how the food at nourishing both yourself and others mm -hmm. yes yes and you know another ayurvedic principle <laughs> is that it's very important to praise the chef and show your appreciation for the person who made food for you if somebody else is doing it so it goes both ways oh that, yeah that's beautiful that's beautiful yeah. yeah it's not only a great privilege for the chef uh, to um, be given that responsibility of nourishing others, but it's important for those receiving uh, to show their gratitude. Yes. Um, for what's being offered by the chef. Yes. Yeah. No, that's uh, extremely important. Um, there was something here that I wanted to. Um, you said that um, you're really combining in this book, and it seems like your philosophy is combining very good food, meaning food that is nourishing and tastes good with healthy food. Yes. And that, yeah. um, trying to see where I can find it. Oh, here it is. The Ayurvedic meal is designed to promote optimum digestion and maximum pleasure. Yes. So, you know, we, we uh, read, I mean, there's so much information out there um, about nutrition mm -hmm. and, you know, healthy food. Right. Um, that in some ways, you know, the, that um, vantage point, you know, the writing about nutrition, thinking it's, it feels very compartmentalized. It's also changes all the time. <laughs> um, I mean, the great thing about Ayurveda is that this is an ancient science. These are time-tested principles. Uh, with nutrition, especially Western nutrition, it's constantly changing. I mean, think about margarine. At one time, people thought that margarine was the healthiest way to eat a fat. And now, of course, we think it's a terrible way to eat a fat and the butter is the way to go or oil. And uh, uh, 
And also not everything is right for every person. One, you know, one man's meat is another man's poison. So it has to be good for the individual as well and something they like. And also what's interesting is that there's an element of the foods that you were brought up with. Uh, it's called opasatmia. Yeah. And the foods that your mother made for you or that you grew up with. And uh, different foods nourish different people who have grown up in different ways. Like uh, people in most of Asia grow up eating rice. People who grew up in Central and South America grow up eating corn uh, as their staple grain. And these both nourish the people uh, that grew up with it. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I mean, there's, there's an element in co of comfort uh, yes. in, and, and um, which is not to be disregarded. Yes. Um, in, in eating those foods. And also probably I, I'm venturing to say that there might be um, a greater ability for the body to assimilate and digest those, those foods just because of the, you know, the cultural history with it and um, the body growing accustomed to those particular kinds of foods. Um, yes, that's exactly right. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, yeah. So let's just see. I had to, um, oh, um, you wrote an article for Yoga Journal in 2018 um, about 12 healing Ayurvedic foods. Oh, <laughs> you probably remember that better than I do. <laughs> well, I have some notes here. I, I won't say I remember oh, it. But, um, <laughs> and some of the foods that you describe include lemons, ghee, dates, almonds, mung beans, ginger, which is described as a universal medicine. Yes. Cumin seeds, lassi, which is a, um, a drink that includes yogurt, um, but diluted with water and spiced um green leafy vegetables, milk, and warm water or hot water. Um, any comments? Oh, that's kind of a laundry list, but any comments regarding uh, the health benefits or the Ayurvedic perspectives in terms of healing on those with the, regard to those particular foods? Or well, any, It doesn't have to be all, but it could be one or two or something that pops out. Right. Um, yes, those are foods that are basically good for everybody. Mm -hmm. I think we could throw turmeric in there too. Um, right. But uh, if they wanted me to write about 13. But uh, I think I'd like to address the milk and the yogurt since there's such an emphasis on Yeah, food. yeah, I, I think that's, Im that's important. Um, in Ayurveda, dairy is very important. It cultures the heart oh, and as well as beautiful. nourishing the body. And mm -hmm. One of the problems with milk is that it needs to be prepared properly. And people, you, you don't just go to the, the fridge and just chug it out of the carton. Mm -hmm. um, milk needs to be heated to a boil. And then if you want to have it cool, cool, then let it cool down from there. But boiling the milk takes some of the qualities of dullness out of it. Mm -hmm. And then also milk should only be eaten with sweet foods. If you eat it with sour foods or uh, astringent foods or, or salty foods, it's not so good for you. So I think that's one of the things that's given milk a bad rap is that it hasn't been treated properly. But if you have a milk with a, a dessert, you know, or you put some in your tea in the morning when you're having, a, you know, a, a breakfast of toast or cereal or whatever, then it's very good. Mm -hmm. And uh, and yogurt also is. Uh, a very digestible way for most people to eat dairy. And the lassi that I mentioned, it's diluted with water. So it's very, very easy to digest. Mm. Now, the caveat to that is that it maybe it won't be good for everybody. Maybe some people will get stuffy noses every time they drink milk or yogurt. Um, so this isn't a one size fits all. Yeah, yeah, that's that's beautiful. It's it's important to emphasize that um, you know Ayurveda has uh, something called doshas, and some foods are tridoshic, meaning they're good for all body types or constitute mind body types. Yes. Um, and other foods are better for better for 
one dosha versus another. Right. Um, so in thinking about milk, um, what is it about, it may be good for um, the vata dosha, but not necessarily kapha, or perhaps in smaller quantities. Or um, a non-fat milk or a low-fat milk. Sure. Or a kapha type. Kapha, well, to explain the three doshas. Yeah. They are qualities and everyone has a measure of these qualities and they come from the five elements and um, the five senses. Uh, one is called vata and that is uh, air and space are the, uh, the immaterial qualities of it and hearing and touch are the uh, material qualities. Pitta is fire and water and it's also sight and taste. And kapha is water and earth, which is taste and smell. And these represent three different body types. There are actually 10 doshas because we can be a combination. We can be a, a vata pitta or a kapha vata, or um, you know, most people have some combination. We, we all have all three doshas, mm -hmm. but some of us have more of one than another. And uh, the body types, uh, or mind body types, I should say, of a very predominantly vata person would be someone who's tall and slender, who talks very fast and a little bit erratically, and who picks up information very quickly, but also forgets it very quickly, and they can skip meals. Um, a pitta type, which is more fiery, uh, can't miss a meal. They're the people that absolutely have to have their three squares. They um, might get, they might get with the, the term I think that's used is hangry. <laughs> you know? That's very good. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, and they are more medium build, medium height, often have reddish hair, uh, and very good intellects, good public speakers, and quick to anger, quick to cool down, and a medium, medium memory. Mm -hmm. And then the kapha types are the ones who tend to get overweight and they're more slow moving and they learn things more slowly. Sometimes in school, these kids are thought to be not so intelligent, but it's just that they learn slowly. But once they've learned it, they keep it forever. They have a very good long-term memory and uh, often have very thick wavy hair and uh, are, are the bigger types. So I have a lot of kapha in me, for instance. Mm -hmm. And there are different foods that nourish these different doshas and foods that are not so good for each dosha. So mm -hmm. in the case of milk, uh, a vata type and a pitta type um, who have a sweet taste as part of their makeup, um, it's very good for them. For mm -hmm. a kapha who puts on weight and who uh, whose digestion is a little slower, um, whole milk could make them a little more sluggish and so they should drink it a little less and maybe um a less fat type of milk mm -hmm. yeah no you, you bring up some um really good points that um first of all i like what you said i i, I was i never heard that before about um milk in general in terms of about the heart yes isn't that, that wonderful it, yeah, that is wonderful. I love that image that nourishes the heart. Mm -hmm. um, and also the the preparation that, um, you know, um, simply drinking um, cold glasses of milk from the refrigerator is just um, um, really not going to be easy to digest. Right. right. Um, and I think also, I, maybe I read this in your book, but, you know, Ayurveda doesn't recommend copious amounts of dairy. Right. Uh, it's it's really um, in moderation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that could certainly make a difference to overall health as well. Oh, sure, sure. Well, yeah. all things in moderation. Of course, of course. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, let's see if I had, I did have some other things. And make um, meal time a celebration. Sit down when you eat. That's much better for digestion than standing up and eating or eating in your car as you're driving to work or something like that. Sit down when you eat. Have uplifting conversations. It's not the time to have political debates. And uh, just really enjoy your meal time. And even if you're just by yourself, enjoy your meal time. Enjoy your food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's something that um, I think that really makes a difference in terms of digestion. 
Yeah, I mean, my trick in college. And happiness. Yes. Happiness. And uh, you said your trick in college? Oh, was, uh, you know, I'd make a sandwich and then I'd be driving to my class and eating my sandwich <laughs> whenever there was a red light. And, I mean, a terrible way to eat. You know? uh, yeah, yeah. Or, you know, sometimes, um, uh, you know, you'll see people just walking, standing and, and eating their food. And it's just, mm -hmm. um, it's hard to do that mindfully. Yes. And uh, so have, really taking the opportunity to appreciate, sit. Um, it doesn't have to be an elaborate thing, but no. really, um, and, you know, taking the time to eat your food properly mm -hmm. and enjoy uh -huh. it. Uh -huh. and, so. and sit for a few minutes after a meal. Don't just immediately jump up. Just sit for a few minutes and that helps digestion too before you get up and go about your day. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there's some other things. Um, you have some things here. Um, we're in the winter season now. Yeah. Um, any suggestions for winter pick-me-ups for each of the doshas? Uh, Vata, Pitta, Kapha? Well, uh, or in general, general um, tips mm -hmm. about winter? Well, uh, the seasons are guided by the three doshas too. And Vata mm. season is the winter season when it's colder and the wind may be blowing more. And uh, so it can aggravate Vata in people. So you want to eat the foods that pacify. That's the word that's used, pacify mm -hmm. Vata. Mm. So actually warm milk is very good. Um, grains are good. Uh, warm soups. Just the, the kind of the um, the common sense things about winter winter eating. Yeah, maybe heavier, more unctuous foods. Yes. That um, both warm the body and, you know, there's a feeling of um, comfort and satisfaction. Yes. Uh, so that's, that's what I think about in terms of winter. Yes. Um, yes. So. Uh, Spring is kapha. So that's when you, you you may have put on your winter fat and uh, and it's time to eat lighter foods. Sure, sure. Yeah, I know Ayurveda puts an emphasis on um, that the change in the seasons. You know, there's that window in terms of the change of the seasons uh, and how that's an important time to, for transition. Yes. In terms of diet. Yes. Yes, the change of seasons are... Uh, affect your physiology and your mind um, mm -hmm. as you change over from one to the other. So it's recommended that those are very good times to do a cleanse, for instance. Mm -hmm. And then you can cleanse out any excess vata that you gain during the winter mm -hmm. or excess kapha that you gain during the spring or excess pitta that you gain during the summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's, one, that's, one thing I can recommend that's really good for digestion and cleansing as well uh, is a ginger pickle. And this is very easy. You just take a slice of fresh ginger, a thin slice, and you sprinkle it with some lemon juice and some salt and eat it half an hour before you have your meal. And that, that gets your digestion revved up and ready to, ready to work. Okay. So right. that yeah. helps too. Sure. Yeah. The ginger pickle. That's, that's, uh, I'll, I'll include that in the show notes. That's, that's important. Yes. Yeah. It's very helpful. Yes. And I know Ayurveda in terms of digestion, um, you know, that Ayurveda uses the word Agni. Yes. And, um, really emphasizes the strength of your digestion. Yes. Um, could you speak to that or the, you know, how that's important or you just talked about the ginger pickle, other things that can, um, enhance, um, general tips? Sure. Well, uh, digestion itself is called Agni, A-G-N-I in Ayurveda, which means fire. And it's considered a digestive fire. And when it's strong and you digest your food well, whatever you eat, uh, then you're going to be healthier. If your uh, digestion is weak and uh, the fire is not so strong, then uh, you can accumulate what's called AMA, A-M-A, which is uh, no uh, uh, pun there, but- uh, Which is what? Which is what? 
AMA. Right, AMA. Yeah, yeah, that, that's funny. I, I never um, put that together, but that's that's great. We, we used to laugh about that a lot, <laughs> learning about Ayurveda. Yeah. Um, and AMA is a kind of a sticky, toxic substance that forms in your body when you don't digest your food well. So you want to keep your digestive fires strong, um, which is watching your health in general. That ginger pickle is very good for helping pick up the uh, digestive fire. Um, doing a, a light cleanse at the change of the seasons helps remove ama and excess uh, of the doshas. And uh, not overeating. Uh, and all those principles of just eating, sitting down, enjoying your mood, your food and your mood. Yes, and, yes. Uh, uh, promote good digestion. Of course. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's really great. Um, let's see. Ginger is great for digestion. Lemon water is also very good. Mm. Take them separately, like to drink a glass of lemon water in the morning when you mm -hmm. wake up or something like that. It's, it's very good for the whole digestive system. And how would you, um, you, before you talk, you said lemon, you said something before lemon. Was it ginger? Ginger. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, it's kind of hot and a little spicy. And it's sure, like sure. Well. Chilies are a little too strong, but ginger is just about right. Yeah, Fresh the, or powdered. That's that's great. And lemon water—that's really mostly first thing in the morning, or is that something that you could have you periodically have it throughout the day? Okay. Um, yeah. uh, one of those tips that you mentioned was sipping warm water. Yes, ver versus good. versus cold water. Right. And sipping warm water throughout the day uh, is very good for digestion mm -hmm. for everybody. So, and um, um, if I what, why not cold water? Uh, cold water douses the agni. Okay, it, um, it's not good for digestion. Yeah, uh, where the warm water stimulates. So, the, the, if we're thinking about agni as the digestive fire, mm -hmm. um, would it be? correct to say that the cold water really dampens the fire yeah yeah in general very cold food is um is not so great for digestion although pittas crave cold food and and i remember when the vajas were talking about this in front of marisha he just started laughing and he goes well how can we make it so everyone can eat ice cream uh, <laughs> so you know these aren't strict 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 rules but yeah, yeah, they're got they're guidelines. Exactly, guidelines. The and warm uh, food is good. Okay, uh, yeah, you talk about um, and the warm food is because it's easier to digest. Yes. Okay, um, and you do talk a little bit in your book about cold foods and that some cold foods, like a little bit of salad, is okay. Oh sure. Um yeah. and um, but not to make it, you know how many times people will make salad their main or if you're going to have a salad you'll have warm components in that salad yes um yes yeah, so you can have roasted vegetables in a salad for instance sure sure um describe a, a salad that would that would fit that bill that would be um essentially you know what would be the components besides roasted vegetables um well uh for the winter season for the winter season, grain salads are very good. Yeah, uh, I have a recipe in uh, Heaven's Banquet for a wild rice salad with dried cranberries, for instance. That's very uh, nice. And um, uh, rice salads. Uh, Perhaps a barley uh, salad. A, a, if you can make a barley salad, it's a little uh, barley is hard to kind of keep in whole. Yeah, I think it would be a little too mushy, but right, it could be. You could do it. You try it. Sure, and, sure. Uh, yeah, a pasta salad. Sure. So whole grain salads would be really nice, um, mm -hmm. served at room temperature at or room warm temp, yeah. uh, during the winter season. Um, let's see. Okay, we talked about nutrition. Let's see what else I have here. Um, Uh, wish that your table ever be filled. Tell me about the name Heaven's Banquet. Oh, my former husband came up with that. And uh, it just sounded right. So 
it's a wonderful name. Thank you. And I, I was just wondering what the, what the significance of it, you know, what the meaning, and did it have a particular meaning or you just love the name? Just love the name and, okay. and I wanted food to be heavenly. <laughs> That's beautiful. And That's our beautiful. lives to be heavenly. And, and for life to be heavenly? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's... Mom, uh... Marie, she always says life is bliss. She said this whole idea that life is suffering is very <laughs> wrong. Yeah. Uh, well, that's... And, and, I, I, and I think I've also heard in Ayurveda, not only bliss, but joy, which yes. is essentially... Um, I'm not going to say they're identical, but they're, they're pretty close, bliss and joy. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Being happy is very evolutionary. <laughs> you know, that's a, it's very spiritually evolutionary to be happy, to laugh a lot, to. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it, it sure uh, is much more appealing than, than what you indicated um, that life is suffering. Yes, yes. You know? that, that whole idea and that you have to suffer to do great <laughs> art and uh, all of that is, is something that Maharishi doesn't give any credence to. Okay, that's wonderful. I like that. Um, let's see. When we're thinking about the tastes that appeal to each of the doshas or that balance the doshas, yeah. vata, pitta, kapha, and in Ayurveda, we have the six tastes. Right. Could you, could you say a little bit about the tastes and the importance of ha incorporating the six tastes at every meal? Yes. Um, and just, you know, the tastes that are appropriate for the doshas. And, and again, these are guidelines and not, you know, rigid. Oh, yeah. You don't want to drive yourself crazy trying to do this. But sure. in Ayurveda, they emphasize six tastes, mm -hmm. which are sweet taste, sour taste, salty, pungent, which is you know spicy, um, bitter and astringent. Astringent is kind of a strange one. Lentils are astringent. Um, okay. Persimmons and pomegranates are astringent. Um, yeah, that's a that's uh, a hard one to identify sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So I have lists in Heaven's Bank. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, but uh, having the six tastes as much as possible helps balance you and maintain good health and maintain digestion. So it's good to... Um, Again, to emphasize taste, good taste, and to use mm -hmm. herbs and spices and make your food really taste good and uh, uh, and have those six tastes in your food. Mm. I don't know how possible it is to have it at every meal unless you you know have forever to figure out what you're going to eat. But sure. well, basically, yeah. And um, with um, vata, are there particular tastes that are um important for vata to have in terms of balance? Yes, sweet, sour, and salty. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, sweet includes grains, mm. um, sweet taste, not just sugary things or, or things mm -hmm. with sweeteners in them. Sweet fruits, of course. Sour would be sour fruits. Yogurt is considered sour. Sure. And then salty is, is salt. Yeah. So you need course. those three. Uh, one of the problems with people's diets is that the Western diet has essentially just been sweet, sour, and salty. And the pungent, bitter, and astringent have been left out. In, mm. in all fast food, that's all you're going to find is sweet, sour, and salty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, hence our, our um, American obsession with coffee. Oh, yes. Which is the, which is the bitter taste. Yes, yes. Um, so, um, and I think that um, pitta, I'm looking at in terms of your book, you indicate bitter and astringent is good for pitta. Sweet, bitter, and astringent. Sweet, sweet as well. Okay, that's right. Sweet as well. Okay. Um, and kapha is a little bit different. It would be more the pungent taste. Pungent, bitter, and astringent are kapha okay. tastes. Okay. So all spices are great for kapha. Okay, right. And bitter, bitter greens, green vegetables are, are considered bitter. Okay. Very good for sure. Coffee. Leafy greens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, you also have in your book, and you've mentioned some of them, but tips that really apply to everyone, regardless of their constitution or their dosha. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple of these tips are um, one of it, eat when you're hungry. Yes. Yes, you don't want to eat on a full stomach because that is going to interfere with digestion as well. 
Okay. So wait between meals, wait until you're hungry. Don't just snack all day. Sure. Cause in the American way, we, we hear the contrary that, you know, many people are, um, although now intermittent fasting is quite popular. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but many people are eating small meals and, you know, frequent meals and that would be really contrary or I, I really, does it depend on your, your dosha or your body type regarding that or? Not so much your dosha. I mean, there are certain people that have to like diabetics right. sure. have to have, you know, to balance their blood sugar need to have food during the day. But sure. this is a general rule. Of course. It's good to be hungry when you eat. That means the digestive fire, the agni is, is burning. It's strong. Pretty, of course. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and any moderate, a moderate amount, they say to be um, three quarters full. Yes. For a meal. Three quarters full. Okay. Beautiful. Um, let's see. Fresh foods. You talked about that. And um, you have this quote uh, that you include in your book to begin um, or, okay. To begin or end with your, in your meals in terms of let us be together, let us eat together, uh, let us be radiating truth, radiating the light of life, never shall we denounce anyone, never entertained negativity. And that's a quote from the Upanishads. Yes, yes. That's just a good watchword for life. It definitely is. Yeah, it's, it's, it's also a reminder to... Um, um, it, it's kind of bliss out loud. Yes. You know, yes. uh, and to entertain positive thoughts versus negative. Yes. And, uh, bringing that, bringing that, um, bliss into the, into the meal time, into the food preparation. As um, much as possible. I yeah. mean, one little caveat that we should say is that if you aren't feeling blissful and you feel like you have to appear blissful and happy, <laughs> that's, that's really not good. I mean, we're no. not necessarily going to feel blissful 24 hours a day. Of course not. But, um, but don't, don't eat when you're really upset or really angry. Yeah. That's a good time. Even if it's mealtime, just don't eat when you're in that state. You're too turned up. You're not going to digest well. Sure. Absolutely. No, that's, that's, that's so, so true. Um, let's see. I mean, we tend to run for food sometimes when we're upset to kind of be a comfort, but yeah, wait till you calm down a little. Sure. I, it, that's, um, that's really a good suggestion. And you talk about, um, cravings in the book yes. as well. And, um, could you address that in terms of an Ayurvedic perspective? Um, sure. and I guess I'm referring to mostly unhealthy cravings or, or if, you know, uh, at this point, per perhaps that's the wrong way to describe it, but. Well, there are, we do at times crave foods that are not healthy for us necessarily. Mm. Uh, or we can crave foods that maybe are, but that we want to eat in an excessive amount. We just can't stop eating them. Um, I mean, like a little bit of sweet is good for vata and pitta, but if you're eating large amounts of sweets all day because you crave sweet, then something is out of balance. Cravings mm. indicate that something is out of balance. Mm -hmm. And the way to deal with it isn't to try to punish yourself and refuse to eat whatever it is you're craving. That's a very punitive and a very ineffective way of dealing with it. If with anybody who's ever had a craving knows that if you try to make yourself stop eating it, you're going to go and eat six times more an hour later. So uh, the Ayurvedic perspective is to see what's out of balance in your body, in your life, and restore that balance just in general to life. And, and eat mindfully, as you said. Mm, yeah. And uh, overall balance should help take care of a craving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful because I, I think that, you know, um, the, you should, you know, just really, um, not advocating ayurveda doesn't advocate a punitive approach right right not at all and to um just but what it what you seem to be saying is that it encourages it encourages us to cultivate an awareness yes of what is going on with us that's you know um fueling this craving 
Yes, yes. Um, um, another thing that you can do is often the cravings are caused by excess ama from that that toxic, sticky stuff that forms when you haven't had good digestion. The, and you can get cravings if you have ama. And again, that would be a time for a gentle cleanse. Mm -hmm. And that would help also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and when you talk about a gentle cleanse, you could do a home cleanse. Is that? Yes. Or you could certainly do it under um, an Ayurvedic doctor's supervision as well. Sure. Um, sure. So there, there are various options regarding that. Mm -hmm. um, and let's see. If you have a chance to talk to a good Ayurvedic doctor, it's really illuminating. What they do to determine what doshas you have is they take your pulse. I think and that's, pulse. yeah, it's, that's amazing. Yeah, there's a wonderful Ayurvedic doctor in, in Iowa of all places. Her name is Dr. Nancy Lonsdorf and she was trained in, uh, in Ayurvedic medicine. How do, you spell, how do you spell her name? L-O-N-S-D-O-R-F. And she's at the Raj, the R-I-J, Ayurvedic Clinic. I, I will include that in the show notes, her name as well as the Raj in Iowa. Mm -hmm. And um, did you work directly with Nancy? Uh, at times, okay. yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. There was um, a point, it was kind of funny, where um, somebody had uh, told Marishi that I was consulting with different Vaidyas and... Uh, and he said, tell her not to consult with the Vaidyas because they all have their own opinions. <laughs> so, <laughs> so at that point, I stopped, you know, bugging the okay. Vaidyas. I see, I see. So you were, you were doing your own investigation. Uh, and uh, that was kind of like his advice to you regarding the cookbook. Yes, that's that's what he meant. With about the oh, he didn't mean about don't see vidas about your health, but oh yeah, the about cookbook the cookbook. Okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, they do have different ideas about diet, and there's things that I've included in Heaven's Banquet, which I explain. Some vidas think aren't that great. Other vidas think they're fine. Uh, so, yeah, again, yeah. Well, that's it's it, that's true. There, it's it. I mean, it is a Ayurveda is both a science, uh, an art, and a science. Yes. Yes. And the main thing is to be, put yourself in balance so that your own body's inner intelligence is telling you what to eat. Because yeah. we all have it. We all have body intelligence. Yes, yes. And uh, we talked about leftovers and some of the, you know, we, we I don't necessarily like to have lists, do's and don'ts, but mm -hmm. um, maybe we can look at some of the don'ts that and, and see if there's still don'ts or what you think about them. <laughs> Leftovers we talked about and yes. about um, whenever possible, eat fresh food. Yeah. Um, and then you also talked about Ayurveda. Um, it indicates that it's important to reduce the following foods, preserved foods, fermented foods, canned or frozen foods. Right. Um, now, fermented foods seem to be, I mean, they are the rage yeah. Uh, and there's this, um, you know, the, um, uh, the, the probiotics, mm -hmm. it seems to be, how would you, we're, 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 we're sort of in the same area as dairy, you know, how would you, how do you reconcile the American now where fermented foods have really, especially kimchi, sauerkraut, um, they are just ex very, very popular. Yes. Um, yes, they are. And, um, Ayurveda says, okay, um, and, and, and they're promoted as being um, very helpful to, to the digestion. Yes. Um, well, all I know is that Ayurveda doesn't necessarily recommend uh, a lot of fermented foods in your diet. Yeah, yeah. And we'll see if this stands the test of time. Sure. It's one of those foods that's supposed to be super healthy and everyone's supposed to eat it, and three years later... That may change. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I was I was reading that um, those foods um, increase ama. Oh, uh huh. In the body. Yes, yes, because they're hard to digest. Yeah. They're not, yeah, they're not. They're I I I don't know technically why. Yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. I was just curious because it just thinking. 
And I think, um, although Ayurveda isn't strictly vegetarian, your cookbook is vegetarian. Um, the ancient texts, the, the Vedas, um, really discourage, except in certain situations, eating meat, fish, and eggs. Well, that's, uh, at least the Ayurveda of this time, that's a recommendation. But it sure. doesn't mean you have to be vegetarian to be Ayurvedic. Okay. Uh, generally, if you eat meat, then chicken and fish, poultry and fish, are the ones that are recommended the most rather than red meats. Okay. Um, so don't feel that if you're not vegetarian that you can't be Ayurvedic. Okay. Uh, so it's possible to... Um, um, so I, so Ayurveda is not strictly a vegetarian diet. No, no. Actually, if you read Charaka, uh, mm -hmm. he describes the effects that different meats have on mm -hmm. the body, but mm -hmm. he's talking about them as medicine. Yes, not so as the, the food you would be eating every day. Use more uh, as a, for medicinal purposes. Right. Okay. Because everything that there is that isn't poisonous is going to have some good effect on the body on somebody's body at some time sure, uh, sure. an old ancient story of um an ayurvedic doctor who had a group of students and for a test he sent them out and said bring back a plant that cannot be used as a medicine and so <laughs> everyone went out searching and then they all came back with their plants and one uh young man had nothing and the other students were just, you know, mocking him that he hadn't found anything. Mm. And uh, then the teacher asked him and he said, I couldn't find a plant that there wasn't a medicinal use for. Oh, he said, you've got it. And okay, that's, that's well, wow. well, wow, that's, so that's everything wonderful. has some use for somebody. Sure. At some time. Yeah, okay. That's, uh, um, that's wonderful. And that's great to keep that in mind as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so there, in some ways there's no absolutes. No. Um, no. so there's an adaptability and a flexibility depending on season, constitution, state of health, age, time of day. Yes. Uh, there's a number of factors that Ayurveda weaves into, um, just really trying, trying to keep that balance. Yes. Yes. And if you have a really serious condition, you know, by all means, uh, uh, an Ayurvedic doctor may prescribe a specific diet for you to help mm -hmm. that condition. So yeah, yeah. we're talking about just generally people that are more or less healthy. In general, good health. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know that Ayurveda discourages onions and garlic. Yes. Tell me about that. Uh, well, again, they're foods that have physical health values to them. Mm -hmm. So... They, I mean, uh, garlic is touted as being very healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, but the subtler levels, um, the, the levels of spirit are not nourished by onions and garlic. Mm -hmm. So um, Chinese Buddhists don't eat them. Um, Brahmins don't eat them necessarily. Uh, uh, I know that uh, in ancient Egypt, the uh, priests didn't eat them. So it's more of a spiritual value than mm -hmm. a health value, mm. a physical health value. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've read regarding those foods is they're what's called rajasic, mm -hmm. or they're overstimulating to the mind. Well, they're actually tamasic. They're, oh, they're, they're tamasic. Kind of, okay, yeah. tamasic. I mean, That's then good. we have okay. to talk about sattvic rajasic. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, we don't have to get into their dela. So tamasic would be. Um, Foods that are dulling. Dulling, dulling. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. Um, so okay. onions, garlic, leftovers, uh, food eaten when you're angry or upset. Sure. So they would be. They would be. Um, they would be dulling to both the body and the mind. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sure. Because Ayurveda doesn't make a distinction between mind and body, and mm. spirit. They're all one. Yeah. Yeah. And you yeah. look at the whole person when you're looking Ayurvedically at somebody. Yes. So if you go to see an Ayurvedic doctor, they're not just going to be taking into account whatever your physical condition is. They'll be looking at your mental health, your spiritual health, all of it. Yeah, it's a it's a very much a holistic approach. Yes. Okay. Yes, you can't divide those up. Yeah. 
No, oh, that's that's beautiful. Um, let's see. Let's see if there's anything. Um, let's see, Charaka Samhita. I think that um, you mentioned in the book the the ancient text, the, the Charaka Samhita, mm -hmm. that it recommends. There's a recommendation in terms of somebody who's trying to change their habits mm -hmm. um, regarding food and nourishments to do so very gradually. Yes. 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 If you want to, I mean, there's no reason why we can't change what we eat if we want to eat in a more healthy fashion, but don't try to do it all at once. Again, you'll just fail. You'll be back at, at what you used to eat right away. Okay. Um, so just do it very gradually, just introduce a little bit more and a little bit more and, uh, and do it gradually. Okay. Uh, and do you think that um, in terms of making long-term change, um, that um, adopting that gentle approach and the gradual incremental approach, that you're, you're more likely to sustain that change? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. I think uh, anybody who's tried to make a very radical change in their diet uh, knows that they struggle with it. And... Uh, it's just, it's, it's easier to do and the effects will last longer if you do it gradually. Okay. All right. That's beautiful. Um, we talked about the impact of the seasons. Is, is there anything else that you'd like to add regarding seasonal cycles and Ayurveda from an Ayurvedic perspective or overall health perspective? Um, just that each season is governed by one of the doshas. So mm -hmm. if you don't know what your doshas are, you can go by the seasonal doshas. You can eat a more vata pacifying diet in the winter, in mm -hmm. the spring, a more copper pacifying diet, in the summer, a more pitta pacifying diet. And that will be very helpful. Okay. And, uh, and also that kind of weather, even if it's out of season, if you have a very cold, blustery day in the summer, uh, that's a vata day. Sure, so sure. It, it's not just the seasons itself, but the kind of the, the seasonal weather patterns. That Absolutely. Are. Okay. So really paying attention to um, what dosha is most prevalent or important to balance during that season, vata in the winter, kapha in the spring, and pitta in the summer. Right. And uh, also just being aware of that even if it's uh, winter and it's a it's the vata season where there's increased mm -hmm. vata, um, that if you're in Southern California and you have an 80 degree day, then it's not necessarily not necessarily a day to be pot pacifying vata. So just keep in mind. <laughs> exactly, right, right. exactly. Okay. I remember going to a big Christmas celebration. It was 85 degrees in Santa Barbara, and, uh, <laughs> so uh, you know, of course, people didn't want to eat warm heavy right right very filling foods then yeah yeah absolutely um let's see what else i have here anything else um okay fresh meals um oh um this next question probably appeals more uh, both to ayurveda and to um for, for those people who are interested in adopting an Ayurvedic vegetarian approach, mm -hmm. how does an Ayurvedic vegetarian meal, um, you talk about, it's very different than kind of your meat-based meal or, you know, really, how does that look? Well, I mean, it's not that you have, you know, the meat and the vegetable and the starch necessarily. Sure. Again, what you want to go for is balance. Mm -hmm. and what season it is. So um, bean and uh, dal, which are very small beans, are very good for a gentle protein. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the six tastes are very important. Mm -hmm. And it, so it doesn't necessarily have to look like a Western meal. Sure, sure. And I, I, you also emphasize that 
there might be, um, there's not going to be like the main event necessarily. Right. Uh, like meat yeah. or fish would be a main event that a vegetarian meal is um, maybe um, a few more dishes, but smaller, smaller amounts of each dish and kind of different component parts that would make right. up that meal. Right, uh, right. If you go to an Indian restaurant, for instance, mm -hmm. yeah. there's many little dishes sure. of different foods. And there isn't one that's the, the main dish. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that's a very balanced way to eat. And, and the six tastes are involved a lot in, in that kind of food. Mm -hmm. Okay, beautiful. Um, just to talk about soup for a moment. Sure. You say the challenge in Ayurvedic soup making is to coax enough flavor out of the ingredients. Now, um, we're going to make a stock. We, we're not using onions. We're not using garlic, uh, which they, they do. There is a punch in their flavor. Yes. Um, so how, how do we create delicious vegetarian soups without without those ingredients or any suggestions or recommendations regarding that because it is it is a soup season yes. I assume winter yes. would be I think is a soup season yes yeah uh -huh. um well I have a, a couple of recipes for vegetable stock in my book which mm -hmm. help get the flavors started and then uh using your herbs and your spices and cooking your vegetables in a if you're using vegetables in a very flavorful way. For instance, a roasted beet is much more flavorful than a boiled beet. Mm. So you might want to roast your vegetables before you put them in a soup and then mm -hmm. cook at least a little bit and then put them in the soup. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have to look elsewhere for the flavor than just, you know, an onion laden stock. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I like your um, choice of words, coax. Mm -hmm. That, you know, you want to, how do we, you know, we really have to, um, well, just simply going from um, meat-based cooking into vegetarian cooking, there's there's more of a challenge in terms of developing flavor, right? Um, and um, but when, you know, in Ayurveda, eliminating the onions and garlic, you know, it's it, it's so um, so many cuisines are are using those ingredients that mm -hmm. you know, thinking about developing flavor without them. Well, you learn. Yeah. I haven't yeah. used them for, you know, how many decades? Uh, sure. Don't miss them. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, definitely, a, a, that's one of those um, gradual or, or, you know, yeah. just trying to figure yeah. out. A little, a little squeeze of lemon juice helps too in a soup. Yeah, so the, the acid is important. Yeah. Um, Ayurveda states that good food stimulates all the senses. Mm -hmm. the important of the importance of the senses um to both well certainly that's they're going to be important to digestion but yes. just to the overall experience of food yes and the enjoyment of food you want it to look appetizing smell appetizing taste of course appetizing um the texture of the food is mm -hmm. important so uh all those, I don't know about hearing what we can say about hearing, but uh, other than talking and a nice conversation while you're eating, but. Um, well, hearing maybe in the preparation, just hearing certain sounds that yeah. are in, in, indicate that food is coming. Yes, <laughs> that's you true. Know, so, so for the yeah. cook, the sound is, is perhaps stimulating to the appetite for the diners. They, they may have had, they may have missed that experience. Right. Right. They're not hearing the sizzle <laughs> on the griddle or. Yeah. You know. Yeah, exactly. Um, but you know, you see food that's supposed to be so healthy and it just looks like this brown blob and doesn't smell very good. And that's just not going to stimulate your Agni to, to want to eat it. No, no, not at all. You know, um, you um talk about yeasted bread mm -hmm. and that i think the uh in the book you indicated that yeast feeds on ama i mean we're we're in this era now of um 
that, you know, um, people, first of all, not wanting to eat wheat, uh, mm -hmm. but many of the Indian breads are unyeasted in any event. Yes. Um, and, um, and we're also looking at a lot of breads that people are making with sourdough. Any, any comments regarding that in terms of bread overall, yeasted yeast specifically? Well, I include yeasted bread. Sure. In, yeah. In yeah. Um, again, that's an okasetmia. That's something that we are so used to that we right. are nourished by it. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so again, you just want to have very good bread when you eat bread. Yeah. And I think you, you indicated the importance of eating it fresh. Mm -hmm. That helps. So um, freshly baked bread. Yes, as much as possible. Of I mean, course, you're, you're of not course. Get a whole loaf in one meal if you're by yourself. But, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Um, and you mentioned this a little bit in terms of the. You, we're talking about a vegetarian meal and the six tastes, and looking at typically an Indian meal in terms of the balance of flavors and and mm -hmm. how that's incorporated. Mm -hmm. um, but also you talk about the importance of sauces, condiments, chutneys yeah. to ba balance out flavors. And um, could you talk about a little bit about that? Well, that's one way to get the six tastes into your yeah. meal, is to have sure. a really nice salsa with a meal yeah, or um, uh, a pesto or uh, some uh, urban spice combination uh, in, in a chutney or in some kind of little thing that you add to your meal helps balance the six tastes. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and preserved, again, preserved fruits are fine. Uh, so you can have a preserved fruit chutney. Um, yeah, and, and you, you that's, uh, I was wondering about preserved fruits because you said it, per, preserved fruits are, are good. Yeah. But pre preserved vegetables would not be. No, no, just, but fruits, fruits seem to be okay. Fruits okay. that are preserved with, with sweetness or dried sure. fruits or those seem to be okay. Okay, all right. Um, I love that in Persian food that they combine fruits with their, into their uh, main course kind of meals. That you oh, it's beautiful. See. I love it. Well, it's a beautiful cuisine. It is. Yeah. yeah. And um, I think, do they use both dried and fresh fruits? Yes. Okay. I, I love that combination. Yes, me too. Yeah, it's really uh, uh, adds another element of flavor mm -hmm. and, and unctuousness, I yes. think. If there's oil, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, you also said that um, sauces, condiments, and chutney is a good solution for families if some like plain food and some like food that's a little more dressed up. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any other suggestions for Ayurvedic in preparing and making the shift to incorporating more Ayurvedic elements for yeah. families? I mean, you know, <laughs> that's always a challenge. That's a challenge. I mean, you're going <laughs> a to sense of humor. Maybe that's the best yes. recommendation, right? And the food that, you know, the, the, the loving preparation of the food, the loving <laughs> serving of the food, eating in an uplifting atmosphere, eating sure. sitting down, you know, having yeah. to put their phone away. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I that's... think those are, are the best, you know, it, those... you're going to drive yourself crazy if you're- Oh, no. Well, that, the, we, we don't, we, how are we going to have bliss if we're driving, driving yeah. ourselves crazy, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, there, there was uh, somebody who asked Marishi once about, you know, what, what is the best, and this was before Ayurveda came out, actually, uh, but they were really pressing Marishi to tell them what the best food was to eat, and Marishi mm -hmm. was not so eager to answer, but they kept pressing him, and he finally, he said, the, the food your mother makes you is <laughs> I read that you included that in your book. I did, yes. That's a beautiful comment. Yes. I love that. That love is going to go into it. And... Yeah, yeah. And also, I think um, even for those of us who didn't have um, mo mothers who are fabulous cooks, yeah, they, we all have um, food memories. 
Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, uh, even a simple bowl of cream of wheat, lovingly prepared, yes. um, can be um, a lovely food memory. That's very well spoken, yes. You know, so. Do you have a particular food memory that is comfortable? Well, that, that came up. The right, right as yeah, it came up and a and a and a um a dab of butter on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that that's very simple, mm -hmm. but um very nourishing. You know? I, I remember that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, you mentioned in the Charaka Samhita that salt is the best among those substances producing relish in food. Mm -hmm. Well, it does make food taste better. It certainly That's does. What it means. Um, any particular comments from an Ayurvedic perspective or, or just your own uh, viewpoint regarding salt? Well, salt is, is very good for vatas. Uh, so they can have more salt than a kapha that salt is not as good for. So they should just reduce their salt a bit. But mm -hmm. uh, eating unsalted food, thinking it's going to be really healthy for you, um, unless the doctor has prescribed it, uh, is it's just not that healthy because you're not going to enjoy it that much. Yes. Yeah, I yeah. see all these heart healthy diets now that are without salt. Um, yeah, what, there's a there's an acronym for that. No salt, no oil or something. Oh, is that it? Yeah, I think there's, there's uh, I, I forget what the acronym is, acronym, um, but it's essentially no salt, no oil. And that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> oil is a good fats are needed by the body and by the brain. Yeah, your brain, your brain needs to have good healthy fats to work well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there are different kinds of salt as well. You talk there about are. that. There are. Yeah. And I, I I didn't really get into the subtleties of a lot of different salts when I was studying Ayurveda, but there's something you can get in Indian food stores called black salt. And yeah. it's a, a slightly sulfurous taste. Yes, People yes. I love it or they hate it. And that's very good for digestion. Okay. The smell seems to be stronger than the taste. It is. It okay. is. Okay. But right. some people really can't stand it. So right, right. You know, it's got to eat it thinking it's healthy if you don't like it. But I love it. I, I love okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I will. Um, I don't know if I've actually cooked for it, but cook with it. But I know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. is there a particular dish that you like to use that in or multiple dishes? Uh, in in uh, dal soups. Soups okay. were made with, with uh, small beans. Like the split, soup. split, split beans. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, yeah, that's, another yeah. thing about salt is that it's better, if possible, to add it when you're cooking things, when it can fully dissolve, rather than sprinkle it all on at the table. Sure. So better for the cook to cook with salt and, uh, and uh, rather than not do it and expect people to add their own at the table where it doesn't get absorbed and dissolved into the food so much. Yeah, it, it sort of dissipates a, a bit if it's cooked in. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and and it has a more subtle impact in effect if it's if it's cooked in the food versus the salt shaker. Yes. So. Yes, the effect is different. Okay. Um, on your website, you describe yourself as an artist and writer. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about the transition from Ayurveda to art. And I know you in you studied art in school, art history, yes. and then you had a master's in fine arts. Yes. I'm assuming it was the visual arts as well. Yes, yes. It's a Bachelor of Fine Arts. It's an illustration. Um, okay. And I majored in art history in college. Yes. Uh, so I've always been involved with art. Okay. Uh, so it wasn't a transition. It was I see. Something. But, um, you know, I put everything I had into Heaven's Banquet about yes. the beta. Sure. Absolutely everything I know about it and could do it. Well, it, it, show, it yeah. certainly shows. And so when I was finished it, I don't, you know, I just don't have additional things to say. I'm not an Ayurvedic doctor. Sure. And uh, I really said what I wanted to say okay. in that book. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and so I was just nourishing my artistic 
side and uh, I wrote the two cookbooks, The Age of Enlightened Cookbook and Heaven's Banquet. And then I wrote a book about an artist uh, who did Italian street painting, which is those wonderful uh, chalk paintings that are done on asphalt. Yeah, what's, what's, um, they're done on asphalt. Yes, yes. Okay, and are, can you see, are they, are they in the U.S. or is it Italy? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, there, there are street painting festivals in the U.S. I see, okay, yeah. I'm not sure um, if I've seen that exactly. And they do um, them sometimes with really amazing perspective where you look like you're wow. going to walk into a, a deep, over a cliff or something, but it's okay. So it, it feel, you're, that's uh, awesome. What's the name of that book? That's called Asphalt Renaissance. Asphalt Renaissance. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Well, I'll include that in the show notes as well. Okay. Uh, and I know that you were a contributing author to a book on sweets. I was, it's the Oxford university press, um, uh, encyclopedia of sugar and sweets. Tell me about, tell me first how you got involved in that project. Uh, uh, and how that, why that project was important for you. <laughs> well, I got involved with it because I was asked to write an article for a magazine called Gastronomica, which yes. is put out by the University of California Press. It's a, a wonderful magazine about food and food history, about okay. aphrodisiac foods. Okay. So I had written this article about aphrodisiac foods. And that's a fun, that's a fun topic. It's a really fun topic. Yeah, yeah. And, uh. Uh, it's amazing what some people thought would, would be that. But uh, then the editor of that magazine became one of the editors of the Oxford University Press's Encyclopedia of Sugar and Sweets. And she asked me to write an article uh, about Ayurvedic foods for the and Ayurvedic sweet foods for the encyclopedia. And oh. then the editors really liked what I did. And so they asked me to do some more. So I ended up with five entries in the encyclopedia not just one that's awesome i'm gonna to have to read that book oh it's <laughs> it's, it's big i mean if you think that was big, it's more big. it's more it's more than 600 pages i think so yeah okay all right yeah. well they, they be... do these food encyclopedias they have one that's a history of food and one i sure. think wine and then they would do the sugar and sweets one okay and is that a u.s based organization the oxford or is that it, it, well, I, we... i'm thinking about england yeah, it is. It is English, but they do oh, okay. have some publishing arm over here. I see. I see. You can find it here. It doesn't have to be imported from England. I see. Well, that's cool how that evolved. You were you were writing an article, and it was the same editor for both projects. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. just never know where it's going to come from. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And the fact that they were interested in, in having an Ayurvedic perspective um, included as a as a section. Um, it was it was not Ayurvedic, but it was about aphrodisiac food. Aphrodisi yeah. Aphrodisi yeah. Aphrodisiac. So that yeah. that. Didn't okay. really I happen. see. I see. Okay. So you were you were in contributing from that perspective. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Yeah. I've done a lot of food writing that isn't Ayurvedic too. So okay. I've been yeah. a magazine contributor. And You've been a what? A magazine contributor. Okay. And if you look on my blog at miriamcason.com, there's an article I did, which is for right now, which is Hanukkah about the history of potato pancakes. Oh, yes, I saw that. I yeah. I, uh, I think you also included that under your article section as well. Yes, I did. Yeah, or you had some recipes in there for the potato can. I think you also had the history as well. Yes. That's cool. Yes. That's really great, yeah. Um, let's see. Yes, I taught courses on culinary history through um, of the organization road scholar i don't know if you're familiar oh yes I'm, I'm familiar i'm familiar they do uh, oh that's wonderful uh it's they usually cool. organize tours right 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 but they're educational tours so they have lectures so i was a lecturer um that did uh different food histories histories of italian food of american food of uh, uh a lot of different topics i have a lot of interests in yeah yeah that's what i that's what i um I gleaned that from your book because you include quotes from MFK Fisher mm -hmm. uh, and you're really marrying um, the beauty of this art and science of Ayurveda with your own um, personal interest and, and curiosity oh, yeah. about food. And um, you were also paying homage to some wonderful food writers and oh, thinkers, yeah. people who have... Um, 
you know, they, they've really given uh, their heart and great consideration to um, um, culinary delight. Yes, it was really fun to find the food quotes. I, I found them all over and uh, loved including different quotes from authors ranging from uh, Sophocles to Fran Lebowitz. Uh, it, adds, it adds interest and humor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I laughed out loud sir, at, at some of them. So yeah. thank, you for, thank you for including them. I remember um, Fran Lebowitz said, bread that must be cut with an ax is bread that's too healthy. <laughs> that's great you grew up in berkeley and 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 you grew up in um well, let's say the bay area and obviously yeah. an area where food and um um reverence toward food and um it, it's really part of the culture yes in terms yeah. of a qu high quality and carefully prepared artisan foods, um, organic you, food, or organic, uh, California cuisine. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, think that growing up in that area, I, I mean, do you think that really, um, how did you, what sparked you in terms of culinary delight? I really have to credit my mother. Okay. She was a wonderful cook and an adventurous cook, and she got me going in the kitchen very young. And uh, that's so great. Really, all credit to mom. And, okay. Uh, today that's is the wonderful. anniversary of her death, actually. Um, oh well. Uh, her yard site. So, um, uh, good memories of mom in the kitchen, and and my parents liked to go out to restaurants, and so we okay. did explore the Berkeley okay. food heaven restaurants. Sure. Uh, my father once did a, he was an engineer and he did a job for Chez Panisse. He, um, <laughs> uh, their pizza oven was sending smoke out into the restaurant and he fixed the problem. And he took <laughs> payment in meals. Oh. So we got thousands of dollars of meals at Chez Panisse. <laughs> oh my <laughs> goodness. That's a drop of a hat. So I was, uh, had a, a very good history with Chez Panisse for a while there. That's so, wonderful. Yes. That's really wonderful. Yeah um yeah and, and my um, family would talk about food we would all gather around the entire family would gather around to watch julia child on sunday nights and uh, okay. my brother is an excellent cook too he's he's a vegan and he's a very adventurous vegan cook mm -hmm. well that's uh that's remarkable because um many people will grow up with a parent who's um intrigues you know who's with wonderful food, but not necessarily be encouraged to, to um, engage in the kitchen at a young yes. age. So I yes, think that, that part, that, that that's really the link that's important. Yeah, yeah I was lucky. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, the, you have an article on your website and um, the title of the article is the best meal I ever ate. Oh, yes. First of all, I love that title. Uh -huh. it, it goes back to, to me, it resonates with food memory, you mm -hmm. know. Um, I'd like to read um, the last few sentences from that article. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, this was not <laughs> Ayurvedic food. So. No, no, and, and definitely not Ayurvedic, but Ayurvedic principles. Yes. <laughs> and it, it brought bliss. <laughs> An absolute bliss. And, and I, I felt bliss reading it. Okay. Uh, the mushroom chunks, chewy yet tender, with the essence of the woods exuding from the juices that exploded with every bite. The stew was rich, complex, and yet oh so simple, so right. The flavors spoke of a clear, clean place of vibrant pure air where flora and fungi pushed through rain soaked loamy soil made from the fallen leaves of a thousand autumns the stew tasted of a life force that had survived and replenished itself for so long that it might just outlast the war the threats of the bomb clashes between new paradigms and calcified social structures and the travails of one 
shy, and anxious person struggling through the transition from girl to woman. It was the best meal I ever ate. Um, and in describing this article, in, or in the article, you say that you wrote this 30 years after it happened, and this was yes. a meal you were describing um, that you were involved in part of the preparation for during your college years. Yes. And I, first of all, I, I love that. I think it's just um, really wonderful writing, lovingly written. So um, thank you for that. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah so that was that was a great memory. It was uh, uh, they, a couple went out mushroom hunting and they brought back these big, gnarly, incredible mushrooms and that we cooked a mushroom and chicken stew with. And uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was just fabulous. And the company was wonderful. We were just all sitting around on the floor around a wood stove. And... <laughs> I loved how you described the different, and you also described all the different colored bowls and the different assorted bowls that they had. Yeah. And uh, it was just, uh, <laughs> it was just great. You it know, was a little college scene, yeah. <laughs> um, I think what intrigues me is that you were able to conjure up that food memory so vividly 30 years later and write about it. Mm. Well, food memories are very strong. <laughs> they're, they're very, very strong. I had uh, an experience once with a um, cooking for a, he, he was an elderly TM teacher who uh, was very strict about the way he ate. He would only eat two bowls of food uh, mm -hmm. at a meal and I mm -hmm. was cooking for him. And, uh, and he was always very strict and telling me I was giving him too much and things and complaining. And I came in one day and he was eating a can of sweetened condensed milk right out of the can. <laughs> and you know, I looked at him, we, we called him the professor. He was like, professor, what's this? And he had been in a Japanese concentration camp as a child where oh. they were starved. And when the Americans liberated the camp, the first thing they did was an airdrop of food into the camp. And there were cans of sweetened condensed milk. Mm. And that memory was so strong for him mm -hmm. that he said just every once in a while, he just has to eat a can of sweetened condensed milk right out of the mm. can. Wow, wow, so, wow, that's, that's really, yeah. Uh... Yeah, that was a happy memory. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was, um, yeah, that that's, well. Wow. That... Hopefully we have gentler memories. I, I hope so, yeah. yes. Um, I'd like to, um, you said that in your book, um, Excuse me, sir. That I'd like to end with the watchword. You called it a watchword in your mm -hmm. book. Work like you don't need the money. Love like you've never been hurt. Dance like nobody's watching. Isn't that great? It is wonderful. It is wonderful. So, um, a very wise ancient sage, that's a great. <laughs> Yes, it, 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 it's, uh, there's no more to say after that. No. <laughs> yeah, it, it, at least for me. So um, anything else that you'd like to add for our viewers and listeners of the Healthy Peaceful Podcast? Just to really enjoy your meals and enjoy making them. Absolutely. So Miriam, thank you so much. Um, and uh, your website is Miriam Miriam Kassim Kassim sorry dot com. Right. Um, are there any social media handles for you that? No. You, not okay. Really. So your all your all of your information, your art, um, and books, everything is on your website as everything well. Everything is on the website, and yeah. on the blog is a book that I wrote about growing up with music in the '60s in the San Francisco Bay Area. Oh, and okay. I got to interview a lot of the musicians, so that's fun to read. That's in the blog. Uh, that's a that's a fun one too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very different, or perhaps not, from Ayurveda cooking, but um, that that's part of the incarnation and wearing many <laughs> many hats. Yeah. Or or or. or um, 
ve being very curious. So thank you for that. But but there's information about Heaven's Banquet on the on the website, and you can get it very inexpensively from Amazon or probably secondhand bookstores. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time today, and um, I really appreciate it. Mariana's is awesome. Thank and, you. Uh, I really enjoyed talking. Yeah, to you. I so did too.